I'm going to share this last message this this Sunday for for this wonderful year. Um, for me, the year has been amazing. It has been very busy and very productive. Do you know that you can be busy and not productive? That's right. You are up and down, and at the end of the day, you say, "What have I done with myself?" And there's nothing to account for your for your business. But the Lord has been good. Um, us sitting in this place is a sure sign of the faithfulness of God. Um, Christmas season, I grew up in an environment where Christmas was celebrated. Christmas was one of those seasons where mom would start getting us to decorate the house from probably around this time. For 14th, the 15th of December, we would start putting up stuff in the house to a point where the house is over-decorated. <laughs> I grew up in an environment where mom and my sisters would bake cakes. We actually ate cakes every single morning. For as long as I remember, they baked cakes for us. We didn't buy bread, but they would bake cake. So I think well, my wife can bake and so that tradition continues so I don't miss being at home. Uh, but Christmas was such a great time of celebration. Mom would write cards out to our relatives. Back in the days where you'd write a Christmas card, you'd send it out and uh, would expect some to come back. And when there came a time where some of the cards were no longer coming as, as quick as we expected, would recycle the old ones, would put them up. <laughs> you would agree with me that for a long time Christmas has been over commercialized. Yeah. yeah. You'd agree with me that a lot of us get into Christmas and we actually forget why do we celebrate Christmas. Yeah. And I've realized that the enemy has actually used that commercialization of Christmas to steal the meaning of Christmas from us as believers. It's a season where a lot of people will go out and visit relatives. A season where people will just party. Mm. A season where a lot of people will actually drink themselves to death. Yeah. But you as a believer, what does Christmas mean to you? When was the last time that you actually paid attention to why Christmas is Christmas? Bear in mind that, you know, there are so many arguments concerning whether Christ was actually born in December or in July. You know, I'm not here to argue about the days, but you can't argue about the birth of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So what I'm saying here today is whether Jesus was born in December or in July, Jesus was born. Amen. So this season is a season where we are putting aside time of acknowledging and celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus. Amen. What does Christmas mean to you? And I want to encourage you in this season, let's bring Christ back to Christmas. That's right. Will you make a decision in this coming season to bring back Christ to his season? Will you be part of the world where they actually take out Christ from Christmas and they replace it with Xmas? Because to them, Christ is no entity. But to us, Christ is the hope of glory. That's right. To us, Christ is the reason why we are what we are today. So this morning I want to share with us life lessons from the Christmas story. Life lessons from the Christmas story. As we enter into this season, the enemy is going to divert our attention from the main thing. We start, we start measuring on the minor things. And then you wonder why when you start your year, come January, you are so drained in your spirit, man, to a point where even if you are to make New Year's resolutions, they will not stick because the environment is not right. Yeah. But I tell you, if you can pay attention to what Christmas is all about, it will set you up to a greater year, the coming year. So let us go to the book of Luke chapter 1 from verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It's going to be a long reading, but let's read the word this morning. That's right. Luke chapter 1, 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice! Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Verse 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, 
and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One is to be born, will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. When you look at this story of, the, of Christmas, there are a number of lessons that if we can pay attention to, they will set us up going into 2015. And I believe some of the things we will share this morning will be quite key to the way God wants you to live life come 2015. Maybe you've been asking God and say, Lord, how do you want me to live come 2015? If you can pay attention this morning, there could be one or two things right here that will shape your coming year. Now the Bible says, an angel came to Mary. And the angel just came and gave forth a profound greeting to Mary. And Mary was shocked. Mary was surprised what men of greeting this was. The first lesson that we draw from this Christmas story is that we serve a God who makes promises and keeps the promises. That's right. We serve a God who makes promises and He keeps them. To a layman person, this might sound nothing serious, but when you have been promised by so many people and they've never come through, you are bound to have issues when God starts making promises to you. Because you're saying, what is the difference? So many people have made promises in my life and they've never come through to, for me. Especially if it was a father figure or an authority figure that has made promises and they never came through. But this morning I want you to understand that the God that you serve is faithful. He makes promises and He keeps them. That's right. So when you read in Luke chapter 1 verse 30, the Bible says, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will, receive, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. You see, the birth of the Lord Jesus was prophesied by prophets of old. Isaiah was one prophet who was so accurate in his prophecy concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus. When you read Isaiah 7 verse 14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When you go down in Isaiah 9, 6, the Bible says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now between the time of prophecy and when this prophecy was, was fulfilled, there was 750 years. I want to ask you a question this morning. What promises do you carry in your life today? And how far back were those promises given to you? Is there a word that the Lord has spoken over your life? And how far back has that word been spoken? You see, the birth of Jesus proves to us the faithfulness of God with regards to His promises. There's a scripture that says, Though His promises are many, and yet they are yes and amen. As you celebrate Christmas in 2014, may you be reminded of the faithfulness of God concerning His Word. Many times we give up too early. There is a Word that God has spoken over your life and you look at five years have gone by, one year has gone by and you say, maybe God was not serious. You know, I want you to know that God values His Word. And there will never come a time where God says, Sorry, I did not mean what I said over your life. 
You see, when God gives you a promise, hold on to it because He will follow through. He will bring it to pass. Our attitude to the spoken word will determine whether that word will be fulfilled or that word will not be fulfilled in our lives. Now, the issue is not with the word, the issue is with the recipient of the word. What has been your attitude to the word of God? When you read the word, what is your attitude with regards to the word? Numbers 23 verse 19 is clear that we know. The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said it and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? If man has betrayed you before, if man has not followed through their promise, I'm so grateful today that our God is not a man. Therefore, let's put him in a different category. He is God all by himself. When you read Isaiah 46 verse 9, the Bible says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. So if I have disappointed you in the past, you have a reason to celebrate because God is not like me. He says, I am God like no other God. I am not like any other man. So this morning, can we come to a place of saying, Lord, I choose to give you another chance. I choose to trust you again. Despite the circumstance in which I find myself in, if you have spoken it, it settles it. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, I'm God and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand. You see, the counsel of the Lord is found in His Word. So when God speaks to you, He's talking about His counsel. He says, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel, from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. So as we celebrate Christmas this year, in the same way that God followed through His word, after 750 years, I want you to go back to the promise of God over your life. I want you to go back to your diaries, to your journals, where you've journaled every single word that God has spoken to you. I want you to go back and remind Him of His word. Because it says, my word will not come back to me void. My word will prosper in that which I've sent it to do. If it was the word of God, He will surely follow through. If it was coming from the mouth of a master, He will follow through. I want you to know that the word of God is like a messenger. It's like a messenger that is sent out and that messenger is not allowed to come back until the word is is fulfilled, until the message is delivered and received. So the Bible says the word will not come back to him void, but it will go back after it has accomplished what it has purposed. I don't know how 2014 has gone for you. Maybe it has been filled with disappointments. Maybe 2014 has been a difficult year. But I want you to know if you go back to the word, your 2015 could be a better year. Because the Bible says nothing was made which was not made by the word. So if you carry the promises of God, you got to go back to that place. What is the second lesson that we learned from this Christmas story? God is not interested in your ability, but in your availability. God is not interested in what you can do. But he's interested in your availability. So when you read in Luke 1 verse 34, the Bible says, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One is to be born will be called the Son of God. When you go down to verse 38, it says, Then Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. God had an agenda and was looking for someone to use to bring it to pass. God wanted to redeem his people. And I want you to know that even today, God has an agenda on earth. God has a mission that he wants to fulfill. And he has always had a mission from the beginning. From the time that man was 
was separated from God. It's like God was on a mission to bring back His people. God was on a mission to call back His own people. When you read Isaiah 6 verse 8, the Bible says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? God is on a mission. But that mission will not be fulfilled unless He finds an individual that is available. How available are you this morning? You see, the favor of God came upon Mary and she became part of God's delivery plan. Are you available this morning to become part of God's delivery plan? Come 2015. Do you know that being used by God is finding favor with God? It's an honor for you and I for God to say, can you partner with me in what I'm about to do on earth? You see, Mary was a virgin. Mary was engaged. So Mary could not have given birth because she was a virgin. She had not known a man. So what this angel was asking her to do was a near impossible or was an impossible mission. It was not going to be possible for Mary to give birth to a child. Now I want you to know that when it comes to the things of God, it's not about what you can do. It's about what? It's all about what you're availing to God. <coughs> You see, as you celebrate Christmas, ask yourself, am I available for the master's use? Because you see, if Mary was not available to be used by God, I don't know what God was going to do. But God being God, he was going to come up with another plan. Because you see, none of us are invincible. But Mary was favored and honored by God. And Mary was about to miss an opportunity to be used by God. And she started giving reasons. What reasons have you been given in 2014 for you not to be used by God? What reasons have you been giving to God when God has been calling you to stand and declare certain things? That's right. You see, the angel made it clear that it was not for her to figure out how things were going to work. But it was for her to provide the womb. It was not for Mary to figure out how things were going to work out, but it was for Mary to provide the womb. You see, when God calls you out, you might not figure out how He's going to do things, but God is saying, if you make yourself available, I will give you the ability to do what I've called you to do. Because you see, God is in the business of calling those who are downtrodden. Those who seem not to have anything on this earth or any, any title, God is saying, I want you. Because in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Amen. And Mary finally gave the right response, says, Behold the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Question, what is your response to the calling over your life? What has been your calling to the voice of the Lord? What has been your answer to the voice of the Lord over your life? When you look at Luke chapter 5 from verse 1 to 6, it speaks of Peter. When the Lord Jesus wanted to preach and there was no space, he asked Peter to give him his boat. And he says, Peter, can, you, can I use your boat? I want to preach to the people. Now at the end of his preaching, he gave Peter an opportunity to, to make a big catch. Now Peter was a seasoned fisher, but despite his ability, one night he went without catching anything. One night came where his skills fell short. One night came where he he toiled and nothing worked. When you're reading Luke 5 verse 4, the Bible says, When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. See, the response of Peter was key to this breakthrough. Though he was skilled, he said, for this point in time, I have tried, I've used my skills, I've used every, every connection that I have, and nothing has worked out. Let me give this word an opportunity. Yeah. 
So Peter was available to give God a chance to do something with his situation. You see, until you are tired of trying, you might not see the power of the word in your life. Until you say there's no other option except this option, which is the word of God, you might not see the power of the word working in your life. You see, Peter could have ridiculed the Lord Jesus. He could say, what are you saying to me? This same place you're asking me to cast the net, I've been casting the net all night long, and I've been fishing for the, for the rest of my life. Since I was old enough, I've been fishing. What can you teach me? Because Jesus was not a fisherman in the natural. Mm. But you see, Jesus is a Lord of all. He's a Lord over your circumstance. He's a Lord over your situation in your house, in your marriage. It doesn't matter how long you've been married. You can never be so experienced that you don't need the word in your marriage. That's right. I don't know how many degrees you've got. And you're almost boiling because of the number of degrees. It doesn't matter how skilled you are. You need the word in your life. Because nothing was made. That which was not made through the word. So Peter came to a place where he said, Lord, because you have said it, I will still cast the net and look at the results. This morning, as you enter into 2015, I want to ask you a question. How available are you to seeing the word becoming a reality in your life? Or we have become so sophisticated that the word is of no value to us. Point number three. Great exploits are born out of humility. Great exploits are born out of humility. That's right. Luke 2 verse 6. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth a son, her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So they had gone to be for, for, for the census, and that whole city of Bethlehem was fully booked. There was no inn, there was no place available or a decent place where Mary could have given birth except this place where sheep were being kept. Now, the king of the universe was born amongst sheep. This was not a five star treatment. It was the humblest of places. You see, there were no bells and no whistles which were heard, and yet God was being born in this small city of Bethlehem. You see, when Jesus came, he did not ask for an audience. He did not ask for the whole city to stop and say, Look, I have arrived. The one who will deliver you, the one who will reconnect you with your father, I have arrived. There was no herald that was heard in Bethlehem, and yet the king was born. The little town of Bethlehem was not aware of the profound activity that were happening behind the streets. The little town of Bethlehem was going on in its own bars and activities, and yet something profound was happening in its midst. Yeah. You see, many times we are worried about being behind the scenes. We are worried about not being the main man or the main woman. We are worried about not being called titles. We are concerned about not being seen where everybody else is being celebrated. Yeah. But I want you to know that each great exploit is perfected behind the scenes yeah. before it is revealed on a public platform. That's right. Each great exploit is perfected behind the scenes before it's exposed on a public platform. You see, when God is allowing you to be in a place of humility, in a place of hiddenness, He is working you out and perfecting you so that when you are ready to be revealed, you will be without blame, you will be without sport, you are able to withstand the pride that comes with being in the spotlight. Yeah. All public victories are preceded by private victories. All public victories are preceded by private victories. Have you been able to overcome your issues with your wife, with your own kids, before God can entrust you with an entire company to deal with? Come on. Have you been able to overcome pride when God has given you the first car, before He gives you a whole lot of businesses? 
Could it be the Lord is saying to me, Michael, I still want you to pass this test before I expose you. I care for you so much that I don't want you to fall in front of people. Come on. The Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. James 4 verse 10. 1 Peter 5 verse 6 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. 2014, what has been the state of your heart concerning this matter? Maybe you've been in this church and you know that God has called you to be teaching the word. God has called you to be doing certain things. And something is rising up inside of you. Don't they know that before I came to this church, I used to preach in crusades. I used to be called titles. But when Jesus was born, no sirens were heard in Bethlehem. And yet, the King of Glory was born. Somebody says, if you're not a good follower, you cannot be a good leader. Before we all become leaders, you've got to be a great follower at some point. If you're not prepared to serve somebody's thing, you're not ready to have your own thing. That's right. You see, God is looking for those who are lonely, those who have a contrite and a broken heart to use. You see, in the same way that he came in simplicity, he's saying as you celebrate my birth, would you consider breaking yourself so that I can shape you into what I want you to be? Because you see, when you have a broken heart, when you have a soft heart, Jesus comes in and he molds you in the way that he wants you to be. He changes you and he shapes you into the vessel that he wants you to look like. But you see, when I'm a hard person, the one way that he can change me is to break me. And in that moment of brokenness, he reshapes the, the, whole, the whole vessel. You see, the Bible is full of stories showing how great men had to experience moments of humility and moments of hiddenness. I can talk to you about Moses, where Moses was very aware that God had called him to deliver the children of Israel. Moses was away, that is why he, he, he saw one day the Hebrew and the Egyptian, they were busy fighting and he stepped in and thought his time had arrived. But God was saying, you're not yet done, you're not yet ready for this work. And out of this incident, we see God chucking him into the desert and was placed under his father-in-law's school. If you are married today, there's nothing as challenging as staying with your father-in-law. <laughs> There's nothing as humbling as staying with your father-in-law. More so working in your father-in-law's business. It's, not, it's generally not that easy. I'm not saying it cannot be done. But Moses was placed under his Jethro's leadership. Moses was placed in a desert and for 40 years, the man of God who had been called to deliver the children of Israel was now looking after sheep and cleaning them of their sheep down. What was happening here? God was training him in the moment of humility. God was fashioning a character that he, was, he wanted to come out for him to be ready to face a Pharaoh. You see, when God took Moses into the desert, he was preparing him so that when they come out from Egypt into the desert, he would have had an experience of the desert. You see, you cannot take people where you haven't been before. So when, she, when, when Moses took them out into the desert, it was not a surprise for him. It was not a shock for him. When they were complaining about the lack of water, he knew there was no water in the desert. He was ready for it. So what am I saying here? Don't run away from that moment of humility. If it is your season, stay put. Allow God to accomplish his work in your life. I can talk to you about Joseph. Joseph was a highly favored man or boy amongst his brothers. Joseph was loved by his brother, by his dad. I would call him the blue-eyed boy. His dad loved Joseph so much. But I want you to say that when Joseph had a calling and this dream in his life, God took him from a place of being prominent, a place of being the favored boy, to a place of being a slave boy. And from being a slave boy to being an imprisoned slave. How low can you go? You are a slave and then you are in prison. How low have you gone? 
But throughout his journey, the Lord was preparing him for his calling. I can talk to you about David. When David was anointed as king, he did not go into the palace straight away. David went back to look after his father's sheep. And at some point, David was promoted to go serve the king and playing the harp. For this king was tormented by a bad spirit. From that place, David went and started fighting the wars of the Lord before he got to the palace. By the time he got there, he had learned what it meant to look after sheep. He had learned what it looked like to look after the king. He saw the king living out his life. He learned the, the bad, the good, and the ugly. Great exploits are born out of humility. Lesson number four. God wants to trust you with his secrets. God wants to trust you with his secrets. When you look at Luke chapter 2 verse 8. Now they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in his sweating clothes, lying in a manger. These shepherds were up and about doing their own thing, and heaven smiled at them and revealed this great act. <coughs> you see, when you're busy serving God, busy doing what God has called you to do, God will reveal to you what He's about to do. You see, God does not want us to be in the dark with regards to what He's about to do in our lives. There's an illusion, there's a thinking, there's a myth that God wants to play hide and seek for us on us. Almost it's difficult for us to see the will of God and to know the perfect will for us. But I want you to know that God takes pleasure in revealing mysteries to His own children. The question is, are we willing to hear what the Spirit says at all times? He takes pleasure in announcing things on earth before He does them. You can see in Amos chapter 3 verse 7, where it says, Surely the Lord does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. I believe that we are a prophetic people. And through the word of God, we have access to the mind of the Father. Through the word of God, we have access to the divine nature of God. Through His promise, we can access to what God wants to do. You see, I'm reminded of, of Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 18 verse 17. Where God and these two angels came to him. And they spoke, and, and they spoke about the birth of the son Isaac. And when they were about to leave and they were walking out. And God started saying... Shall I hide this thing to my friend, what I'm about to do to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? Should I hide it from him? You see, the heart of the Father is when he looks at us, he wants us to be in the knowledge. He doesn't want us to be ambushed. And I've always made this prayer and said, Lord, I don't want to be taken by surprise. Can you reveal to me what what you're at in this season in my life? And God wants to do that. There are certain things that make it easier for us to access the secrets of God. A heart that fears God and friendship with the Lord. When you read in Psalms 25 verse 14, the Bible says, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him. And He will show them His covenant. Now what is it about the fear of God that gives us access to His secrets? You see, when you're talking about the fear of God, we are talking about reverencing God. You see, those who reverence God have access to His heart. You see, the sacred things that you carry, you treasure them. And you don't just share them with anybody. You don't just walk up and you're walking out of your car and you see this person, listen, I want to tell you something about what's going on in my life. You don't do that. So that's the same thing with God. When you reverence someone, you pay attention to their words. The reason why the Lord will reveal secrets to those who fear Him, it is because they will not take those secrets for granted. Could it be that the reason why we haven't been hearing God that much is because we haven't been paying attention whenever He speaks? We all know what He wants us to do. 
But some who just don't get to pay attention. You live by what they tell you. So when you reverence somebody's word, when you respect the word that is preached in this church, you pay attention to what is being taught. And because you pay attention, you get more revelation from the word that is being preached. Now if you don't place value on the teachings in this church, you will go without. And you continue seeing the, the, the lack of the revelation. Because you don't place value on what's being taught. So when God says that you are paying attention to what He is saying, He says more. That's right. When you look at John 15, verse 15, it says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now this friendship is not the, the Facebook type of friendship. <laughs> You know when people send you requests for friendships? You just want to, when did I meet this person by the way? So now I met them there, bed, bed then, and then just say accept. But there's nothing really going on between the two of you. It's not the type of friendship I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the friendship that is governed by a covenant. A friendship that says I'm in 100%, you're in 100%. You've got my, my back, I've got your back. You are there to defend the cause of your master. You are there to say, Lord, if there's no one who can stand for you, I will stand for you. You can count me in. That's the kind of friendship I'm talking about. Covering friends have no secrets between them. So because of the friendship you have with the Lord, there will be no secrets. He will wake you up in the middle of the night and say, listen man, I want to tell you this, because tomorrow this is what I'm going to do. I want you to be ready. Would you want to be part of what I'm doing? So as we get into this season of Christmas, let's be weary, lest the enemy takes advantage of us. Can we pay attention to what Jesus came in for? Let's pay attention to this season and say, Lord, will you speak to me? Lord, can you give me a word for 2015 for you as speaking God? Lord, would you break my heart? I want to be used by you. I want us to stand up this morning.